I think even if you're doing an interview, you still want to tell a good story. That doesn't mean that you need to edit the life out of a raw interview. Welcome to The Creator's Adventure, where we interview creators from around the world hearing their stories about growing a business. Today, we're going to share behind the scenes of how a successful podcast is run. Hey, everyone. I'm Brian McAnulty, the founder of Heights Platform. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, we're here today with Joe Casabona. He is a podcast systems coach who helps busy solopreneurs take back their time. Joe's strategies come from his many years of experience, over 10 years creating podcasts, more than 15 years teaching, and over 20 years as a web developer. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking with you. We, we got to talk a, a little bit quick before um, about being on each other's podcasts and stuff and found out it seems like we've got a lot in common and you're also doing a lot with podcasts. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. Yes. Likewise. Likewise. So my first question for you is what would you say is the biggest thing either that you did or you are doing that has helped you to achieve the freedom to do the things you enjoy? Um, it's, it's gotta be automation, I think. Um, because well, so let me set the stage here, right? Uh, I've got three small kids. I'm self-employed and my wife is a nurse. Um, and during the pandemic, things kind of came to a head, right? Uh, my wife was still going to work. Um, and so I was watching first one, then two children, and then eventually three children. Um and I was having trouble running my own business at that point, right? Because I was only really working when she wasn't working. Um, and I had a little bit of a panic attack. Uh, and it was like my first one ever. It was very strange. I had never experienced anything like that. And I realized it's because I was so stressed that I wasn't mm. like my salary from my business was still like the breadwinning strategy, uh, uh, salary. And I, I realized that things needed to change. And so I looked at, I made a list of everything I, I did and I circled the things that I personally had to do. And then I either hired a VA to do things or I created an automation or a process to do the rest. And doing that saved me 12 hours per week. And so I could focus when I could work, I could focus on the things I needed to focus on to make money and know that the rest of the stuff was happening behind the scenes. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I mean, I can only imagine I've got one daughter, but three during the pandemic and trying to find time to, to get things done. Definitely. That is a challenge. So at that point, like how long had you already been podcasting? Like how did you get into podcasting and coaching yeah so i my first podcast i started in uh, like the end of 2012 maybe early 2013 but that was a dumpster fire it was just like a bunch of white dudes talking right like the worst kind of format for a podcast um mm. no good moderator it was just like a lot of nonsense no offense to me and my friends who did it but it wasn't it wasn't good content um, and so I launched my main show, uh, which is called How I Built It, in July 2016. I bought the domain howibuilt.it while we were on our honeymoon in Italy. And I was like, I need to figure out a, a, a thing to do with this awesome domain. And then I started interviewing a few of my friends about how they built their WordPress businesses. And I thought, oh, this is this is a good idea for a podcast. So... I launched in July, 2016. Um, I have been self-employed basically since, I mean, if we count high school, since I was 14, save for about six years between grad school and 2017, where I had like full-time jobs to have health insurance. Interesting. So we know that now you've got three different podcasts, podcast workflows, how I built it and start local. So first of all, I guess like what's the inspiration for doing all those? You really enjoy podcasts. And 
then in, in doing all those and doing them for so many years, can you think about maybe one key action that has helped to grow those podcasts? Yeah. So how I, again, how I built it, my main show, like that made money instantly. Like I had a, a sponsor before it actually launched. Um, and so that is an income generator for me. Um, when so I pivoted, I, I want to stop there quick. How, how do you yeah. find, how do you find that sponsor? Cause that's, well, the, that's the dream you. I imagine for a lot of people saying, Oh, I yeah. want to start a podcast. When am I going to be able to get a sponsor? Let me tell you, uh, it was kind of due to a glib email that I sent to somebody who asked for a backlink. Um, they, you know, they said like, Oh, Hey, like you're well known in the WordPress space. I have this new guide. Will you link it on this specific page on your website? And I said, Oh, I don't do backlinks, but I'm launching a new podcast that talks about WordPress stuff. Um, for 99 bucks, you can sponsor that episode and it'll have a forever link on there. And he said, yes. And I was floored. Now the behind the curtain look at all of that is that I had spent years building my network and authority in the WordPress space. I had actually written two books on WordPress at that point. And so I was already a recognized authority in the WordPress space. So I think that's the key. Like if I had started a podcast on fountain pens or cigar smoking or Disney, that wouldn't have worked because nobody knows Joe for those things, or at least not as well as they know me for these other things, right? So yep. if you're starting a podcast today, think about what your expertise is in, where where your network lies and where people trust you, because that's initially how your show is going to make money. Yeah, that's good advice. When I started my first podcast was in, I guess, 2012, when we actually launched it, 2011, when we started recording it, maybe actually 2010, when we started recording, I don't know, around then. Nice. Um, yeah. It um, it only lasted for like one season. We recorded almost two seasons. Unfortunately, didn't get to release the rest. Part of the problem was the the process for editing and everything. We made it way too complicated on ourselves. Um, and I mean, but, in, in 2010, it was already really complicated to do what we're doing e today. Yeah. The idea of exporting like a 1080p video, even like on a good computer, it was still like, okay, let's let this render for 48 hours and then it'll yeah. be ready. Um, and then uploading was a whole nother thing. Um, so yeah, much faster now today to do these kind of things, but also video hosting was so expensive back then. And that made me think of like our, our first sponsor with that. And one of the only ones we really had was a video hosting company that um, we approached them and said, hey, like, we're going to have this podcast. We'd like to use you as the video host. If we like keep your logo in there, mention you sometimes in like the description, um, can we get free video hosting? And at the time, like what they were going to provide us, it would have been like a thousand dollars a month or something like video hosting wow. was ridiculous then. And um, wow. like if you didn't want to be on YouTube and wanted like private video hosting. And right. so we got we got that, which was great. But um, again, it was similar because like we had, we had been known as a web design development studio already. So we had some presence to be able to say like, hey, we're known for this thing. We're starting this show now. Would you want to sponsor it? Um, for somebody who's never done a podcast before or doesn't really have the audience yet, um, one thing I saw that people approached us with, which was interesting, is they said, hey, I'm starting a podcast. If you mention a link to promote my podcast, because I think it would fit your audience just in a tweet or something, then I'll give you a sponsorship slot in like this episode. Oh, yeah. And so they gave it away for free. But I think that was a great strategy because then they got a little bit of promotion from us. I doubt it really did anything, but it also helps them in the long run, because when they approach a sponsor in the future, they can say like, look, I've had these are some sponsorship like slots I've done. And here's like, they, you get an idea of like them reading off the ad copy, like how it works and uh, it's better than not having anything. So I thought that was an interesting approach as well. Yeah, that's really smart. And I've seen people do the same thing with affiliate uh, links, right? Like, so they'll yep. say, uh, you know, this, especially if we both come from the web design space, right? One of the most generous affiliate programs come from hosting companies. And so they'll say, yeah. you know, and, and audible yeah. too. I remember we did like, we made a custom video for audible just because the payout would be really good when people would sign yeah. up for trials. Yeah. So you could always try that if you don't have sponsors. 
I recommend most people, I mean, especially your audience, right? Um, if you don't have a sponsor, quote unquote, uh, you could sponsor your own episode, right? Because you probably have a course or a digital product or an email list that you're trying to build. Um, so I would say make those spots for you and give yourself some dedicated promotional time in your own show. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great advice. And like right now on this show, like we don't have any sponsorships because it's mainly meant as a marketing thing for us. So um, definitely. So if somebody's trying to do that and they say, okay, I get it. Podcasting is good. I can grow my brand. I have the potential for sponsorships. Then back to what I was asking you. Now you've got three podcasts. What's like one of the, the key actions or secrets of how to grow those podcasts? Yeah, right. So let's close this loop, right? How I built it, my main show yep. makes money through sponsorship. Um, I started podcast workflows for that, for this exact reason, right? To build authority. I don't want sponsors on it. Um, and then Start Local is a local podcast that I do with a friend because I am relatively new to the area and I don't know a lot of people. And so the podcast is a vehicle to help me meet business entrepreneurs, activists, people in my area. Um, and so growing each of those podcasts is going to be a little bit different, right? Um, I wish I could tell you that I knew like the secret sauce to building how I built it. It kind of just, it was good timing, right? Um, mm. The type of show I was doing was still pretty new at the time. I was telling not just the success stories, but the failures. Um, I probably benefited a, benefited a little bit from uh, auxiliary search traffic because how I built this came out three or four months after how I built it came out. Um, and so we were kind of doing like similar things. That said, I didn't see like a spike one week and then it drop off, right? I still saw regular growth. Um, I think the thing for that one was bringing quality content to the table because I planned, I knew the people I was interviewing, and I knew the story I wanted to tell. Um, and so I think with any of these shows, it really does come down to the quality of the content you're putting out and the story that you're telling, right? Because everybody, you know, everybody think is the hero in their own mind, right? Or the hero in their own movie. But when you're creating content for somebody, they really are the hero, right? You want to act, you want them to be the hero in the story you're telling. And then you or your guest serves as the guide, taking them from where they are through some transformation by the end of the episode. And I think that each of my podcasts do that particularly well because it's always something I'm thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could tell even looking at like, I, I'm set up to be on your show and you've got that right there in the forum describing that just to make sure that the guest understands like, hey, like the, the audience, like they're the hero and like you're the guide to explain that to them. Yeah, in our I mean in our show doc, right? I have it broken up into acts 1, 2 and 3, right? Where act 1 is the setup, um, you know, uh, I guess to peek behind the curtain again like Brian's going to be on my show. Um, you know, we're going to set it up and talk about like AI with course creation, act 2, I don't want to spoil, but it's going to be a conflict, right? Especially it's like easy to create a conflict with AI. And then act 3 is the resolution, right? So we're taking our hero through okay, they're starting out on this journey. Oh, but they, now there's this tension. How do we get over this tension? And then the resolution is how can I apply what Brian just taught us today? Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I wonder, like, we don't, we don't think about that as much in our like question planning and research. And like, there's definitely a structure to, to how we do that. But I, I like the idea of purposely ensuring you're setting up like a conflict resolution in a way, like however small it is, like not, not trying to right. agitate your guest, of course, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I know, it's not going to be like, Oh, isn't what you do BS, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be like yeah. that. So yeah. Um, yeah. I think that is interesting because like that can happen and come up naturally, but why, why leave that to chance if you can kind of design for it in your process? Right. And, and then if it does come up by chance, how are you going to cleanly resolve it? Right. Um, I was just kind of saying this to somebody um, the other day, right? Like when you fly, 
it's not because like a lot of people will just say like, oh, I just show up to an interview and I want to be as surprised as my my listeners are. So I don't do any research on my guest. Right. But like when you fly, imagine a pilot saying that, hey, everybody, I just learned we're going to L.A. today. I, I don't know how we're going to get there, but we'll get there like that. Yeah. That would be an insane thing to hear. And so when you're when you're driving a story for your listeners, you want to know where you're starting, what the conflict is going to be and where you want your listeners to end up. That's going to be a much more enjoyable experience for your listeners. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And it's interesting though. I'm trying to find the balance in between those things in a way. And I'm not sure if you would agree with me, if it's even possible or not, but personally, like, I guess my view is I also want to find like the balance of what's the right amount of time for me to commit to the podcast, because Mm -hmm. it's not like the main business for me. It's something I'm doing for marketing. And so I have a team involved that's, they're helping me do the research, come up with the questions. But for me, it's kind of like, I'm getting like, sometimes my producer will make me a video say like, Hey, these are the things you have to know about the person. These are different things that, that would be great to cover or get into and then all the questions. So I, I get like briefed on it. So I'm the pilot who says, Hey, I've never uh, flown to LA before, but I've got a map. I know what direction to go. And yeah, these you, are the important things I have to look out for. So yeah, you have your flight plan at least, right? Yeah. Like that's, yeah. yeah. Like the pilot doesn't make the flight plan. I don't think, I don't know. I'm now I'm talking out of my depth here, but someone makes a flight, a flight plan. Right. Um, I, th- I think the balance you're trying to strike is a common one, right? I was talking to Jay Klaus about this um, from Creator Science, and he said that he doesn't want to do so much research that his interviews feel like a profile on somebody because that's very different content, right? Um, yeah. That feels inorganic, whereas the best interviews, if you look at you know Barbara Walters or Larry King – or somebody more contemporary than both of those people who I can't think of right now, um, their interviews feel organic, even if they are edited, right? Because they don't necessarily know what their guest is going to say, but they do know the story they're trying to tell. 60 Minutes, somebody on 60 Minutes, right? They, like yeah. they tell, they tell yeah, good there, stories. There's a process of discovery for the person interviewing, um, asking the questions to be able to to learn new things instead of just, I know the answer to this, but I want to ask it anyway for my structure. Right, because cause at some point it feels contrived, right? Yeah. Because then you're like, so, blah, blah, you did this. Tell us about that, blah, blah, right? Like, it's just like, that feels boring. So yeah. you do need to strike the right balance. And I think editing can help with that too, right? If you get like a lot of, you know, some people will just get a ton of, of B-roll and then edit it together later. And like, that's another balance that you want to strike. Like, do you want to do a lot of prep ahead of time to get the good conversation on tape or on bites? Uh, or do you just want to like have a free flowing conversation and then pick out the best bits later, right? That's a lot of work. But you can really craft a good narrative if you get the right stuff that way. So with all the podcasts that are out there right now, how can you actually differentiate yourself? Because in the past few years, there's been so many different podcasts that have been coming up. Everybody wants to create a podcast. Would you say there's a, a better path of like choosing like to highly edit an interview or even releasing it raw? Yeah, so I think... That again, like the thing that you want to do is create content that differentiates you. And the most popular content today I'm noticing is story driven content, right? Um, History Daily is one of my favorite podcasts. It's a daily event sometime in history. It's 15 minutes. But the host, Lindsey Graham, not that Lindsey Graham, um, tells a story, has a character, names them, sets up, sets up the environment for you. And so I think even if you're doing an interview, you still want to tell a good story. That doesn't mean that you need to edit the life out of a raw interview, but it probably means that you need to do 
more prep than just record and release, right? A lot of people say like, oh, I just want to do like Joe Rogan does and just have like a raw unedited interview. First of all, we don't really know if if Joe Rogan is not ed- like I don't think he's ever explicitly said that his his interviews are not edited. Um, they just feel that way. Just again, like a Barbara Walters interview or a 60 Minutes interview feels like it's not edited, even though those, those definitely are. Um, and it's hard to drive a story when it's not edited. So um, I think that when you plan your show, think about the story you want to tell. Think about how your listener is the hero and think about how either your guest, probably your guest or you are the guide and then the transformation that you want them to go through. If you have those three things, then you're, you're going to be able to craft something that the listener will be engaged with and will get something out of, right? Because your audience, Brian, my audience, we're, we're solopreneurs. Um, we're trying to establish some expertise. So we're not making like serial or criminal or some other true crime podcast. We're making a podcast to help us hopefully grow our business. And so because of that, your listeners want to learn something and you want to do that in the most clear, but also entertaining way possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely agree with, with all of that. I think that the, the format and everything is also important to pay attention to. Like you mentioned somebody like Joe Rogan, like this is a long form podcast. Like, they're like what a couple hours like those episodes they're like three and, hours i don't even know yeah. how anybody <laughs> so <that. laughs> i think that there's a big difference of saying like okay i want a podcast that's 30 minutes long or 20 minutes long and that podcast also being with somebody who you haven't met or don't necessarily know very well versus somebody like i don't know joe rogan's process either or how well he gets to know some of these people before he first talks with them but I also find like if you if you know the person, if you know a little bit more about them, it's easier to ask these different questions to kind of uncover things that they might think about or, or know these paths you can go down and kind of just have that conversation for a couple hours versus somebody who you've never interacted with before. So I think figuring out your goals, the kind of people you want to have on, how the format's supposed to work, that will kind of help piece everything together if, what would make sense for your podcast. Yeah, for sure. And I I tell people they should have a podcast mission statement, right? So I say, your podcast should answer three questions. Uh, Who are you talking to? What problem do they have? And how do you help them solve that problem? Uh, And that usually forms a sentence like, uh, my podcast helps blank solve blank by and then the goal of each episode right so my podcast helps solopreneurs win back their time by teaching them how to work more efficiently uh, on their business instead of in their business yeah yeah that's great and i like the part though also about the entertainment because i think in the space of like this not necessarily like how to podcasts but a podcast where you're trying to share knowledge and and teach your audience in some way it's important to keep the the entertainment part in there because everyone like you're listening to it, not only to learn something, but also to be entertained at some level. And I found that I went maybe too much into like learn how to do things at first. And that actually some of the more personal stories that people had told, like those are the popular moments that everyone can connect to. And I don't know if you have advice for this, but I wish I could come up with, a couple questions or ways to ask things to uncover those better because it's easy to ask somebody like, Hey, like Joe, how do you do this with podcasting? And you might happen to have a a cool story about that, but I can't just say like, Hey Joe, tell me a really cool, like personal story that like your friends really like or something and connect it to something about podcasting. Like if you just put somebody time you had a panic attack, right? Like, (laughs) right. You you either don't know the the context to ask the right question or you're just putting somebody on the spot that they're not going to think of what's the right thing to say. Um, Do you have any suggestions for that? So, Andrew Warner has a really good book called uh, Stop Asking Questions, right? Um, yep. I think one of the things that he says in the book that really resonated with me was the pre-interview. Like, get deep in the pre-interview where you're not recording because there you are learning about your guest and their guard is down a little bit because you're not recording. And so you can uh, 
prep them a little bit and say like, Hey, I'd really like to ask you about this or tell me about this time. Right. Or like, um, you know, when we were going over the questions before and, and you asked, like we were going through them, um, it didn't come up, but I, I had that's the story holstered, right? What I didn't include in that story was that my three-year-old like brought me a bottle of water and told me it's going to be okay. Right. A very emotional, impactful moment in that story. Um, but doing the pre-interview, uh, can really help with that. Right. And so, um, there are probably also some, some kind of leading questions that you can ask during that, like, uh, tell me about a time where you were struggling or, you know, like you run three podcasts yeah. now, was it always that easy? Oh, tell me more about that. Like just kind of the, tell me more. Oh, what's your family life like? And this and that. And what are the struggles that you have being a course creator or a solopreneur? Um, I tell people who are going on podcasts have three to four stories ready. Right. So like, I mean that, yeah. Panic attack story, like I had there, that holstered, be, right? <laughs> because also you have to you have to be prepared when you're going on the podcast. The person interviewing you may not necessarily be good at interviewing, and they may not ask the right questions to get to any of that. So you want to have those things in mind that you you can bring them up if the question is not really, I guess, correct or, or going down the right path um, to do that naturally. Yeah. And like, a, a, sure, a good interviewer will do it. A bad interviewer won't. But you could still have that story. Right. So like I was watching yeah. uh, this is really timely, actually. Right. But I was watching I, I like to watch uh, Jimmy Fallon like clips the night after they're published because 1130 mm. is too late for me. Um, and he had please don't destroy on this is like the three young guys who do those digital clips for SNL every week. And he was talking about one thing and he kind of brought up, he's like, so you've had some really cool guests on, including Taylor Swift, right? And then they launched into the story about having Taylor Swift on a, a very popular and funny skit called Three Sad Virgins, right? Um, and they were ready to tell that story, right? So it's, it. I, I'm going to guess that Jimmy didn't just bring that up in the moment, right? Yeah, he yeah. probably said like, "Hey, I'm gonna bring up Taylor Swift because she was probably the biggest person you've had. Are you prepared to tell that?" And they're like, "Yeah, of course." So you know, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of that, and this is why like research and prep, like a pre interview, are so important. Yeah, yeah, I think I mean I wrote that down myself. I think something that we can probably improve is instead of me just talking about what we're gonna talk about in a pre interview, I should poke around a little bit more, ask a couple questions just to kind of find out maybe these are some other places I can go down when I actually do the interview. And yeah, like I, I interviewed Andrew Warner on our podcast. Um, nice. It's been nice. He he lives here in Austin, so I've, I've gotten to know him. Oh, that's and awesome. um, like I know I've followed Mixergy and, and listened to his show for a while. And so his, his book came out and I thought like, I want to get him on the podcast and teach everybody how to interview. And it was funny because that was one of the moments that one of the big things I feel like I learned from him that I'm sitting there trying to interview him. And I was actually a little bit frustrated because I'm trying to figure out to, to tell my audience and be the guide and say, hey, guys, this is how you should properly interview somebody. But he starts going on about all these stories. And I'm thinking, well, why are you telling me all these like these different things? Like, I want to learn how to to interview. And then I realized that the stories are important because that's what keeps people engaged. And one of the clips, actually, that we had with him, we shared one of those stories about his kids uh, selling lemonade. And he told his kids, like, just tell people they can pay whatever they want. It ended up into a business lesson. But that clip got us like over 50,000 views on Instagram. It beat all of our other clips that year. And it was because it was that personal story. And so it wasn't that he was like off that day or something or like I was not asking the right questions he was doing everything exactly right of realizing the stories are what keep we, people engaged. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. I mean, again, let's look at history daily, right? Uh, Lindsey Graham could just easily, just as easily say, uh, you know, today is uh, November 7th uh, on this day in 2018, blah, blah, blah happened. Right. Um, but he doesn't like he never does that because that's super boring. Instead, what he does is say, you know, it's a cool, crisp autumn evening 
and uh, Joanne is out for a walk along her favorite river, the River Liffey in Dublin, Ireland. The wind brushes past her hair, and then all of a sudden she hears gunshots, right? Now you're in it, right? You'll get to what the actual historical event is, but now you're emotionally invested in it. And so just the same thing with Andrew telling the story about his kids in the lemonade stand, like, oh, man, am I a bad parent for not giving my kids better business lessons? Oh, let me listen in more and see what he did, because I want to take that and integrate it into my parenting. Right. Like it makes you emotionally attached in some way. Yeah, exactly. All right. So you talked a lot about the automation. I want to get back to that now and learn a little bit more about this and share with our audience about like the process behind podcasting, how they can automate that and and add that into their business if they want to, um, without worrying about like it being this whole other thing that they have to do. So I want to kind of hear some, some tips and advice for you on those processes. But before that, I thought it might be good to kind of share a little bit of like the background for our podcast and what our kind of workflow is. And it'd be interesting to hear from you, maybe if you have pointers, if you say like, oh, I'm doing that too, um, or anything like that, or even just to see maybe, maybe both of what we're doing is different, but still works, um, just to give people even different perspectives. So in our podcast, I don't know if it's as much automation, but maybe more delegation where I have four different people, including myself, that are involved in making the creator's adventure happen. So I get to do the fun part. I get to sit here and and talk with people like Joe and uh, get to uh, learn things and uh, have these cool conversations. But there is definitely a lot of other work that is involved in the whole process. So what we do is we have a process for researching for guests and also like guests that approach us and say, Hey, I want to be on the show, like vetting them and deciding if they're right. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but kind of like condense it down. So people get the high level overview. And that is that everybody, no matter if we're asking them to be on the show or they're pitching us, they have to fill out this application form. And that gives us an idea of the kind of things they're going to talk about it makes sure that we have like their headshot, their website link, social media, and all that's ready to go. So that way, when we do produce the episode, if we move forward with it, we don't have to go back and forth and ask them for things. And then once we know that we've got that filled out and then internally someone from my team approves them. So I have one person doing like that research, scheduling, all that. And we send them the scheduling link with a a Calendly link, get them booked um, with the Riverside link to, to come and record here. And then once that is scheduled and we have a date for the recording, someone else on my team then does the research, um, like acts acts as the producer role to learn about that person, learn about both from what they submitted to us and their website, their social media, things I've talked about before um, to make sure that number one, like we're not repeating just the same exact thing they've always talked about, um, that we can uncover something new and that we, we ask the right questions kind of give our audience something useful. So then after that, then I actually do the recording and we don't really have a pre-interview process where we're scheduling a whole separate time for that. I just do something real quick before the actual recording. And then finally I'm done that. I hand it off to our video editor and he puts in the intro that I record, um, finds an intro clip and then puts it all in our nice uh, kind of background and everything like that for export. And the way that we manage that together is we just use a ClickUp list and we have every guest inside that list with a status and like a template for the task that has all these subtasks. Because there's a bunch of little things I didn't mention, like creating the thumbnail for the episode, uploading everything to the right places, uh, getting the audio version versus the video version, and then sending like a thank you email to the guest, sending the guest the link that kind of thing. So the way we manage that is we've got the ClickUp task and then we've got these different statuses that it's like once they're scheduled, then it's in the recording state. Then it goes to editing. Once all the recording files are ready, then edits complete, uh, uploaded and scheduled and then complete. And at each of those steps, we've got an automation in ClickUp that is basically notifying the right person and says like, hey, Mm -hmm. your turn. Now it's like an assembly line of like, all right, now you've got to do this little task 
and then the next person does the next task. And that's worked out really well for us so far. Um, but still, like in our case, like it's it's been really easy, at least for me, but there are four people involved in total. Right. So I wonder if you have any any recommendations or anything you see from what I described there that's that's missing or that could be improved. Yeah. So one of the most time consuming things for interview based podcasts is like the guest research and scheduling dance. And it sounds like you've got that down, right? I have a very similar process where users get the same form or potential guests get the same form, whether they're invited or not. The only difference is that if they were invited, I kind of signal that to the form and they see a different set of questions. Mm. Uh, One thing I like to do here, especially if I'm inviting someone onto my show is pre-fill the form out as much as possible so that they don't have to do as much filling in. Um, And I do that through like URL, uh, like query string URL variables. Um, And so like I have a little builder for that. That's like a little extra. I don't know how many questions you're really asking, um, but like I try to make it as easy as possible, especially if I'm asking a high profile guest. Um, Mm. So that's one thing. And then um, as they move through my process, which it sounds like since you're doing everything in ClickUp, it's kind of the same thing. Um, Once they book through Calendly, I I pass all of that form stuff to Calendly as well. Um, So all of that stuff is already filled in on Calendly for them as well. So um, they don't have to like fill in the form twice. And they... uh, get a Google doc created they get added to my, I use air table. I'll probably be switching to notion. Um, and there's one more bit here that I feel like I'm kind of, Oh, and then they get their own like guest notes and things like that. Right. So yeah, I, I send them the guest notes and they see what's happening. Right. And all of this is automated. So they'll know kind of what to expect on the day we record. I include the pre-interview at the beginning as well. Um, So I think you're doing all of that really well. Uh, One place where maybe there's some improvement, but maybe not, right? Because your like your team goes in and grabs the files from Riverside, right? Um, Yep. How are you doing edit notes? Well, we don't edit the main interview, Mm -hmm. so what it ends up being is like in this case, actually, we did have to pause one time real quick yeah. and, and restart it. So what I'm going to do is go and leave a comment on your guest task and say to our video editor, hey, I actually had to pause this. So there's two files that have to be combined. Just make sure you're checking during that area to, to edit everything together. Um, so yeah, usually it's just a comment with me that I'll leave immediately after to make sure I don't forget. Gotcha. Um, and then I think you also do a cold open, right? With the, with the guest quote too, or you do that sometimes, right? So. Yeah. um, Yeah. So I record that after the episode as well. Okay, cool. So what I'll do there, right. Is, um, during our interview, if you say something that I think is a really good way to open the show, I'll make Mm. that timestamp. Um, and then I put everything in a folder, put it in Dropbox and then like Airtable automatically updates my editor gets an email etc cetera, etc cetera. so um i think another place where uh, it sounds like you're doing pretty well but where a lot of podcasters can improve is taking more notes during the interview i know it's a skill that you need to kind of learn because you're trying to actively listen and take notes but something that saves me a ton of time is like when there's an edit point um for me like because i edit con i edit for content uh, I'll usually write the timestamp down and then like in big, bold letters, edit uh, so that I can provide more context later. Uh, and this is where like a Riverside or a Descript and with their automatic transcripts helps a lot now. Yep. Um, because I usually just would say to my editor, like somewhere around 10 minutes and 19 seconds, we messed up. Can you fix that? But now I can say like, oh, yeah, they went on for like two and a half minutes starting here. Just cut that whole thing out. Um, and I'll do this again. I'll do the same thing for the cold open. So when I pass it off to my editor, I don't have to re-listen, right? Some people are like, oh, I re-listened to the whole thing at 2x. Don't do that. You don't have to do that. You can take notes during the the actual interview and that can save you a bunch of time because now you're, yeah. you know where to edit. You don't have to listen for edits. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think that's definitely something we could improve and I could improve. I'm not really good at clicking like the, the clip button or the, or the marker here in Riverside. And oh, yeah, right. I what, forgot that there is a, a, um, a button here in Riverside that can do that. Yeah, what we end up doing is later, like I use their, their magic clips thing that goes through and tries to make AI clips and then their transcript. Um, but then we also take the transcripts and we put them into a tool called Cast Magic, which does like yeah. a bunch of AI prompts on it. And then that makes it easier to pick out things for like social media clips and all that kind of thing. Um, but definitely like I'll take a part of the transcript and then just screenshot that and send it to the editor to say like, hey, here, like this is the exact moment. So then he can go and find those words instead of having to listen back to it. Because, yeah, they're still not completely satisfied with our, our process for making the social clips. I think it takes us too long. Um, I know it takes us too long because we're, we've got such a backlog right now. And um, yeah, still, it, I know we can do better with it now that we've got AI. Um, but until we fully optimize that, like previously, someone would then go back, listen to the whole podcast over again, and then try to pick those things out. Yeah. And that's tough. Like, that's like, people ask me, like, how can I automate my social media or my clips? It's just, that still needs a human touch. And you yeah. can improve your process to make the human touch more accurate. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, well, I was thinking about that as I was talking about it with you here. One of the things that is really easy if you want to start this and you're saying like, okay, well, I'm not sure about setting up all these pieces to automate right away. Um, I mean, on one hand, I would say if you're starting a podcast, you should plan to like commit to it for a year. So it could make sense to invest into doing all that, um, make it easy for yourself. But one of the pieces that doesn't really require any like technical ability to automate is giving the guest all the information that they need of mm -hmm. saying like, this is how we record it. This is like, make sure you're in a good room with a good microphone, headphones, all that kind of thing, those notes. And like that, you can just put in the calendar invite in the email that they get right after a document somewhere. And so that's easy to make sure that they just have it rather than trying to say, I'm going to start doing everything manually. And then like the day before you realize, oh, I didn't tell them anything about this. Um, right. yeah, or you just yeah. never, never do that. And then they show up and then uh, they're in this really dark room and they didn't know it was going to be on video or who knows. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of the what, one of what I think is the killer features in Calendly uh, is the ability to redirect a, a person to a different page. I don't mm. know if this is just on the paid plan. I like I but Calendly provides enough value that I pay for it. Um, but when someone books for my podcast interview, they get redirected to a page called recording notes. So it's in the email, it's in the calendar invite, and it's the first thing they see after they've booked. So I know for a fact that they, they see these things. Right. Um, yeah. And that's really helped. Like I've had way more prepared guests, like since I've started doing that, and I've also had guests tell me like, hey, thanks. This is the most prepared I've ever felt for a podcast interview. So like little things like that really do help. And, and Brian, I felt the same way. Like got a few emails from your team. Here are the questions we're thinking about asking. Here's all the stuff that you need to know. I, need yeah, I should have asked you that. It's, it's not like you don't know our process. You've kind of been through it. So yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that's great. Right, well, like so yeah, from, like, a, from a end user point of view, right? I did. I felt, I felt more prepared than usual. Right. I'll, definitely more prepared than like, I'll tell you, I can, I canceled a podcast interview that I was supposed to do this morning because mm. they reached out on LinkedIn. Uh, they said, I guess if they're listening, they might know who I'm talking about, but um, they reached out on LinkedIn. They said, Hey, do you want to come on my podcast? I just automatically said, sure. Without really realizing or without really like doing my due diligence. I was like traveling and I was like, oh yeah, let's do it. And then I started to do my due diligence. I hadn't, the only thing, the only emails I got from this individual was their welcome sequence. So they automatically sub subscribed me to their email list, which don't do that. Like, that's like, don't do that. <laughs> like don't automatically do it at least. Um, and nothing else. So I just canceled and I said, hey, I don't really think I'm a good fit for your podcast. Like, I didn't know what it was about uh, until I did my own research. I didn't know what kind of questions it was going to be. And to be honest, I kind of got like 
you're going to sell me. You're going to do like a hard sell at the end of the interview mm. feeling. So avoid that by preparing your guest and letting them know everything that they can expect. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they'll, they will feel more comfortable to, to open up more to you on the actual show rather than that. That'll help ease some of the tension along with like the pre-interview and what you talked about. So, yeah. And then they will be more, yeah, they'll tell those, those personal stories that stick. Yeah. So any, any tools or software that you find indispensable and in, in kind of managing and automating tasks related to podcast creation? And I know you mentioned Calendly as one of them. Yeah. How much time you got? Um, no, I'll, I'll <laughs> mention like three, I guess. Uh, Calendly is one of them. Really any scheduler uh, that works best for you. Savvy Cal is another really good one um, that does a lot of the same things that Calendly does. Um, some automation tool. So I use make.com. I know that make.com is a lot more affordable than Zapier, but can also have a higher learning curve, learning curve than Zapier. So one of those, right? Because like, even with the Zapier free plan, like you can connect Calendly to let's say your project management tool, right? Where like, where it's Trello or ClickUp or Notion or whatever. Uh, so you can at least set up simple automations that way, but make.com for me, like it might as well be my fourth employee, right? Like, it, mm. so it's super crucial for me. Um, and then I also advocate for doing solo episodes, especially if you're a small business owner and your podcast is designed to help establish your own expertise. You can't always do that with a guest, right? Because you're yeah. kind of giving the spotlight to the guest. And when I do solo episodes, uh, Descript is invaluable to me because it's really easy to edit. It transcribes as you record. And so I will usually, if I need to edit or rephrase something, I'll usually just stop recording and then just like delete the text and then pick up where I was, uh, pick up where I left off. You can have the video on, even if you don't release the full video, it can easily convert to like a like a Instagram reel or YouTube short or TikTok style video captions and everything. So really good tool that has has sped up my production process by a ton uh, that didn't exist when either of us started podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. And so if, if you guys haven't heard of that or used it before, like essentially you see the transcript and you can just select a sentence or a word and just hit delete. And now it's gone from the audio and video. And so it makes it really easy to edit, even if you're not any kind of video editor yourself. Yeah, really, really good. I will say if you have edited video or audio, it's going to feel limited. But if you haven't, or if you understand that, okay, well, like this is just kind of making it so editing my podcast is like editing a Word document or a Google document. Like come with that framing and it's, it will make a world of difference. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. All right. So we covered a lot here, but I think there's still so many things that we could talk about. I know that you've got an online course for people who want to learn more about this. Could you tell us more about that? Yeah. So it's a, uh, it's a video library. I've, I've called it by many names right now. It's just called the podcast liftoff playbook. Um, where it's over a hundred videos on everything I know about podcasting broken up into different tracks. We'll say, I call it the Netflix of, of podcast videos. So um, I'll tell you what, if you go to podcastliftoff.com slash Brian, B R Y A N, I will have a special discount for listeners of this show. Um, and I'll also have a free resource. That is my favorite podcast automations. Awesome. All right, cool. And I, I've got one more question for you. And that is, if you could ask anybody in our audience or our audience in general, a question, either something you're curious about, something you kind of want to get everybody thinking about, what would that be? I think it's going to be this, right? Because we have a lot of solopreneurs, probably a lot of course creators listening. Um, as you approach your course or maybe your own podcast, what is the story that you're trying to tell? 
my friend Troy Dean has talked about how when he creates a course, he looks at the whole course and he looks at how to get students from zero to win. And then each m module in the course, how he can get students from zero to win. So I want you to think about your content, maybe like a TV series, right? Over the entire series, what story are you trying to tell? And within each section, maybe each episode, what story are you trying to tell? Because that's really, that's what's going to keep people coming back to your content. Yeah, that's, that's great advice and a great thing to think about. All right. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show. Before we get going, where else can people find you online? My pleasure. Thanks for having me. I am at Jay Casabona everywhere. That's J-C-A-S-A-B-O-N-A. -A -A. I am on X, formerly Twitter, uh, threads, TikTok, Instagram, basically everywhere. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. My pleasure. Thanks, Brian.